This Newsweek magazine inspired today's talk. Take a close look. It says, forget the church, follow Jesus. Now, should we forget the church? I'm going to talk about that in the talk today. Forget the church, it says, follow Jesus. This is not a religious magazine. This is as secular unbelieving as they come. But I'm going to quote from it today. But firstly, it is my privilege to introduce a beautiful and charming and gracious and lovely young lady. I love her to death. She's got the voice and the disposition of an angel. Her name is Sharon Verdi. Would you please welcome Sharon today? God bless you. to me. 
me to the cross of Calvary. I bear them in your name. I won't be ashamed. These cars, oh, these cars. Quoting today from Newsweek, a secular, secular magazine. Famous in North America, famous around the world. Look at it. Newsweek says, forget the church, follow Jesus. What do you think about that? Well, we're going to talk about that. Should we forget the church? What should we forget? Inside, well, there's a picture of our Lord's hand. Amazing, isn't it? The world can't get rid of him. You know, they can say he doesn't exist, but he just goes on existing. That's the problem. Uh, The Bishop of Sydney, I heard him getting interviewed in Sydney. He's an evangelical, great man of God. And Peter Jensen said, they said to him, don't you know Bishop Jensen, Archbishop, that the atheists are having a big convention in Sydney. Oh, he said, that's wonderful. I'm glad they're coming. They talk about God all the time. (laughs) He said, I I notice Christians don't talk about him, but Richard Dawkins can't talk for two minutes before he starts talking about God, who doesn't exist, you know. Now, look at this, though, the forgotten Jesus. He's writing to Christian America. The forgotten Jesus. Christianity has been destroyed by politics, priests, and get rich evangelists. Ignore them, writes Andrew Sullivan, and embrace him. And you're going to notice as we go through today that this is sort of a theme that runs through the talk. If you live by your feelings, you're going to be up and down all the time. If you live according to your feelings and your emotions, you'll be unstable in all your relationships. Your marriage is not going to last. You'll have bad relationships with your children and you'll always be late to church that is if you feel you you should even go so this magazine talks about the problem in the church let me read to you just a bit of it organized religion is in decline organized religion itself is in trouble The Catholic Church is, this is written by a Catholic. The Catholic Church's hierarchy lost much of its authority over the American flock with the unilateral prohibition of the pill in 1968 by Pope Paul VI. But in the last decade, whatever shred of moral authority that remained has evaporated The hierarchy was exposed as enabling and then covering up an international conspiracy of abuse and rape, countless youths and children. I don't don't know what greater indictment of a church's authority there can be except the refusal even now of the entire leadership to face their responsibility and resign. He says, the whole system, from the Pope down, the whole hierarchy ought to resign. Amen. Amen. In repentance for the terrible sin against children. 
Instead, they obsess about others' sex lives, about who is entitled to civil marriage and about who pays for birth control and health insurance. Inequality, poverty, even the torture, institutionalised by the government. After 9-11, these issues attract far less of their public attention. For their part, the mainline Protestant churches, which long promoted religious moderation, have rapidly declined in the past 50 years. Evangelical Protestantism has stepped into a vacuum, but it has serious defects of its own. And he talks about bad religion, how we became a nation of heretics. The forgotten Jesus. Listen to this. I'm ashamed to say this. I want to say this to all the evangelicals like me. I'm an evangelical Christian. Evangelical means you believe in the gospel. Now it's the most abused term, but the word evangelical in itself is good, but not what it represents. Listen to this. And what group of Americans have pollsters found to be most supportive of torturing terror suspects, evangelical Christians. The Christians shout amen, torture him some more. Something has gone very wrong. The crisis of our time, you think this man was preaching, I wish he could preach in a thousand of our Christian churches that have forgotten Jesus. All of which is to say something so obvious is almost taboo. Christianity is in crisis. Seems no accident to me that so many Christians now embrace materialistic self-help than self-denial. Or that most Catholics, even regular church goers, have tuned out the hierarchy, hierarchy in embarrassment or disgust. Given this crisis, it is no surprise that the fastest growing segment of belief among young people is atheism, which has left in popularity in the new millennium. Nor is it a shock that so many have turned away from organised Christianity and towards, quote, spirituality, meditation, yoga. The thirst for God, he says, is still there. How could it not be? Why does the universe exist rather than nothing? That's why I interviewed Hugh Ross. These are the great questions that most Christians are afraid to think about. How did humanity come to be on this remote blue speck of a planet? What happens to us after death remains as pressing and mysterious as they've always been. Now, then he quotes religion. A famous evangelical author and television evangelist. God wants to increase you financially by giving you promotions, fresh ideas, creativity, think big, think increase, think abundance, think more than enough. When a Bible is never opened on the pulpit and people sit and gaze and say, Boy, that's great. You know why? They are living by their feelings and not by faith in God in Christ or is in the word of God. He talks about the forgotten Jesus. It is now a fact that most Christians 
do not know him. I want you to come to a theme text, John 14 verses 5 and 6. Please turn in your Bible to the texts. This is not a feely, touchy, good church. We, are, we want to be in touch with God. John 14, 5 and 6, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But most Christians do not know him. I want to remind every person watching the telecast today at this time of political excitement, Jesus was not involved in politics. Well, he lived in the days of the Roman Empire. Some people would have said, well, Jesus, run for the Senate. Jesus, of course, was a Jew. And the ruling body over the Jews was a group of religious politicians called the Sanhedrin. I want to remind every person here today, Jesus never held political office. And what is more, he never held uh, any church office. You say, but that goes against, oh, well, I'm sorry if it goes against what is wrong. Jesus was the unpolitician. Come to John 18, 36. John 18 and verse 36. Jesus said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom uh, is from uh, another place. Christ followed uh, a higher path. Jesus, unlike the television evangelists that have brought disgrace to the name of Christ, did not seek worldly power, influence or riches. Jesus was a poor man. Come over here to Philippians 2 verses 5 to 8. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8, it says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human nature or the likeness of a man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. I said again, Jesus did not seek worldly power, influence or riches. I say it to every person watching who is deluded by the prosperity gospel, the prosperity gospel is the very antithesis of the teachings of Christ. It appeals to man's carnal heart and is far removed from our blessed Lord. Could you imagine Jesus saying, instead of saying, blessed are the meek, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are those that mourn, Jesus would say, God wants to increase you financially by giving you promotions, fresh ideas, creativity. Think big. Think increase. Think abundance. Think more than enough. The unknown Jesus. You know why most Christians in this country of the United States do not know him? Would you like to know why? Because they don't open their Bibles. They go to churches where the preacher doesn't quote the Bible. Well, he may say a text to make people feel good. As Larry King said some time back, 
talking to a prosperity gospel preacher who had great success and a great congregation in size. He said, why don't you quote the Bible? Well, he said, well, mm, 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 mm. (laughs) it is because people live according to their feelings. And that is why we have so much instability. That is why even in this church, people come to church at 12 o'clock because when they woke up, they were feeling that they didn't feel like going to church today. Has anybody here ever heard of the word duty? Oh, somebody said to me, that's an awful word. It's not an awful word for soldiers. Honor, duty, God, country. I've been, I don't say this self-righteously because I've got no reason to be righteous about anything. But I've got up early every Sabbath morning and driven for the last 24 years. 60 miles to this church and I've done it year after year, day after day, not because I am motivated by feeling because sometimes I feel like giving it all away. But I look to Christ, not feeling, but faith. And that's the reason some of you are in so many problems. I know when you come into church, you can't help yourself. You gotta be playing with your cell phone or else you've gotta be playing with your iPad. If you even invite people over to your house, you can't even have a conversation. You've gotta be texting. What's wrong with you? It is a, don't laugh, it is a sickness. It is a psychological disease. Did you know they've discovered that people who are all the time are suffering a decrease in their IQ. They're dumbing down. The greatest antidote to the dumbing down and this foolishness is a systematic study of the word of God and getting out of bed early and going to church and doing your religious duty out of motivation for Christ because you love him. You do your duty because you love him. People say, why haven't you retired and joined the rest to sit on the beach? Because I have a duty to Christ, that is why. By the grace of God, I will not be a mamby, pamby, wimp that is guided by how I feel. I say this to you. Come over here to Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Now I've got a lot of texts, so you better go pretty fast. 23, 24. Matthew 19, 23, 24. Matthew 19, 23, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Have you ever heard a prosperity gospel preacher talk about this? Hmm? Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So much for this nonsense of prosperity gospel. Would you come to Luke chapter 12? Luke chapter 12. 15 and onwards. Then he said, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable, the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. We're talking now about Wall Street and the bankers. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there, uh, there I'll store all my grain and my goods and I'll get more stuff going on the stock exchange. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good years laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you, then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up 
things for himself, but is not rich towards God. One magazine article said recently that most Christians, people who call themselves Christians, are monumentally ignorant. I've been telling you for years, and I've been pouring out my heart, I've been saying, don't go by your feelings, but go by the word of God. And I know that some of you have obeyed, and you have believed, and you've done it, and you've been blessed. And I know that some of you have said, he's not going to tell me what to do. Nobody tells me what to do. I do what I want to do. And I will always do what I want to do, my friend. Uh, play not the fool. Play not the fool. Listen. We need to be wary of churches where preachers call themselves life coaches. What do you do? I'm a life coach. Oh, who do not preach from the Bible, where the congregation is composed of lost souls who come to hear pleasing things and who do not know the forgotten Jesus. You tell me this is Christianity, this is not the Christianity of the Bible. And there is no place, my friend, uh, where people are more controlled uh, by their feelings than in Tinseltown. Los Angeles, that has polluted the wells of the world with her liberalism and everything else. And you and I are now a part of this culture, you and I will need to fight a little bit harder to escape the mud around us. Come to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. I'm just getting ready to go, folks. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. I'm just warming up, you see. 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 to 5. If I catch anybody not with a Bible, I'll come down and grab you. Yeah, I'll do that. I did it once in church, over in the other church. The lady never, ever took her eyes off the Bible again. I think she's still sitting reading a Bible. 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 5. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge, preach the word. You see? Preach the word. Preach the word. Be prepared in season, out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship to the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. So I want to give you a little counsel today. My beloved friends watching in Australia, I want to give you a little counsel that is based on the word of God and my friends in this great church. Number one, here it is, think for yourself. Number two, be suspicious of authority figures in the world and in the church. Because the president says it doesn't make it so. Be suspicious. Of authority figures, be a student of God's word. Now, a few years ago, I ran a big campaign in Arari, Zimbabwe. Doesn't it sound good? Arari, Zimbabwe. Salisbury, Rhodesia. And I preached the word and I put up all the great prophecies on the blackboard because that is what I do and that is what I was ordained to do. 
man had got on television and was in all the newspapers. It was a national sensation. And it appeared as though at one stage some people told me, hey, the government may close down your meetings in the Arari International Conference Centre because of our success that God gave to us. The devil never wants to close down something that's doing nothing. And they sent along a cabinet member and he gave a great talk and the people said, well, he's going to toss you out of the country. Oh, ye of little faith. The brethren were terrified. <laughs> What's going to happen to us? He came along and I stood here and the cabinet member, he gave a great speech. And then he talked about how the missionaries came to Africa, Livingston and others. And then he turned to me, a minister, a cabinet member in the government, and he turned to me and he made the sign of the cross and he said, in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, I charge you, John Carter, preach the word, preach the word, preach the word. Now this great congregation and the brethren were so relieved. And everybody got up and cheered. But whether they cheer or not, we are called to preach the word. Jesus taught the importance of the individual, that every soul is important. Jesus was a gospel preacher. Look at Luke 15, verses 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners, they were the harlots and the prostitutes and all of the bad people in society, were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And Jesus said, you're right, I'm guilty. He cared for the outcasts of society, especially women. Mary Magdalene, the Bible says she had seven demons. The woman caught in adultery with a Pharisee. He said to her, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. I'm going to say something and I don't want you to misunderstand it. The Christian church needs to stand against sin. We need to stand against those things that undermine the Bible and our Christian faith, that undermine the church and that destroy the nation. The church needs to speak against sin. But we ought to love the sinner. I read in an article some time ago about a gay parade in one of our great cities. And as the homosexuals in this great gay parade were marching down the streets of an American city, some of them held up banners that said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Well, some of you are shaking your heads. I've got news for you. He does love them. You better believe it. You say, oh no, Jesus. Yes, he does. Jesus died for them. If Jesus was here today, they'd come and hear him preach. But they wouldn't go and listen to these charlatans. But as this parade went down the street, a group of Christians, quote, unquote, Christians, on the other side of the street, held up signs that said, uh, burn, faggot, burn. You're going to burn for eternity in hell. Jesus hated sin, but he loved the sinner. And the sinners loved him. I want any person who's watching the telecast, if you're a gay person, I want you to know, while we do not agree with the gay lifestyle, 
We love you and you're welcome in this church. You're welcome in this church. His greatest teaching was the love of God. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but of everlasting life. He told us to love our enemies. That's a bit hard, isn't it? Would you come over here to Matthew 5, verse 43 and onwards? Matthew chapter 5. The favourite topic of his discourses was the paternal love of God, that God loved us. John chapter 5, verse 43 and onwards. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now here's the punchline, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. If you don't do that, he says, you're a son of the devil. That you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. I want to ask everybody watching the telecast, I'm sad that this is even controversial. Jesus said, if you don't love your enemies, you're not one of his disciples. That's what he said. I want to ask everybody watching the telecast, can you imagine Jesus waterboarding somebody? Because it appears in this country the majority of Christians believe it. He said, love your enemies. That is why this man in Newsweek says he is the forgotten Jesus. Did you know that waterboarding comes from the Spanish Inquisition? How tragic that so many Christians in the USA, perhaps the majority, believe in torture and defend it. One of the blackest chapters in the history of this great nation. One was slavery. And one was torture. And if you want to see America survive and thrive, do not condone those practices that will destroy her. How can you be a Christian and condone those things? How tragic that so many Christians are the ones who seem to want wars and who love violence. Am I getting close to you? The forgotten Jesus, do you know him? Do you even know about him? Would you come over here to 2 Timothy verses, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5? 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 to 5, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the, la in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. I humbly ask every person watching the telecast this question, and you sitting in the church, particularly those of you dozing in the back, is it not time to return to the Jesus of the Bible and to follow him? Is it not time for you and for me to break with the pack? The pack. And become true disciples. Jesus taught non-violence. Loving our enemies. And seeking first the kingdom of God. 
He also taught forgiveness to the wayward, the erring profligate who turned homeward. Would you come over here to Luke 15? This is a chapter that should give every struggling sinner who is watching this telecast a bit of hope. And that's what I want to give you. Luke 15, verse 11, you know it well. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me. That's the cry of this generation. Give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set out for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the fig pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up, went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The forgotten Jesus taught forgiveness to the wayward. Jesus had a lot of success with people, but not much success with self-righteous religious people. But he had a lot of success with prodigals like you and me. So there's hope for the despairing. There are two sayings that I wish I could write up on the blackboard, but I don't have room. I've told you this before. Some of you have taken it in. Others of you have dismissed it. Number one, man is far worse than he ever feared to think. Man in himself is fallen. Man is a sinner. Man has a depraved nature. That is why even Christians don't even go to church or keep his commandments. That is why they come to church and they can't stop playing with their cell phones or taking phone calls or wanting to get out quickly. Oh, my, my stomach, I've got to fill it. That is because of their depravity. And depravity causes spiritual blindness. That is why they don't read their Bibles. That is why they say, nobody tells me what to do. Because this thing that is called sin has made us blind to our own faults, but not blind to the faults of others. That's why we're critical. But that is why we move by our feelings and you hear people say all the time well i feel it's right some people say i make my decisions from the gut goodness i feel that it's right i have a, a gut feeling that is a sign of our depravity that is why the bible says jesus said man shall not live by bread alone but by every word and thus, if we live according to our feelings, we are unstable. And some of us here are. Unstable 
in all of our relationships, unstable with our families, unstable with our church, unstable in society, unstable at our work. Because of feelings. And so the first truth is this man is far worse than he ever feared to think. The second truth is God is far better than he ever dared to hope. In spite of our sin and our depravity, God loves us just the same. Yes, he loves the homosexual in the gay parade and wishes to touch him. He loves the self-righteous Pharisee in the church and longs to touch him. Now religion. This man says, forget the church. Well, there's two types of religion. There's good and bad religion. Most religion is bad. Oops. Richard Dawkins, the world's most famous atheist, has a point. He says religion has started most of the wars. Religion today is responsible for covering up the abuse of thousands, tens of thousands of children. Look at the scandals in the Roman Catholic Church, he says. So most religion, I believe, is bad. How does God regard bad religion? Come over here to Revelation 17, verses 1 to 6. How does God regard bad religion? Well, he doesn't like it. Revelation 17, or come to verse, uh, or verse 1. One of the seven angels had the seven bowls, came and said, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute. That stands for the church, the prostitute church, with whom the kings of the earth committed adultery. Uh, the church is in bed with the state here. Then the angel carried me away, away in the spirit into the desert. I saw a woman. And if you come to verse 4, the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She was a part of the prosperity gospel. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things, and the filth of her adultery. That's the Antichrist. God doesn't like it. Look at Revelation 18, verse 11. This talks about the overthrow of this system that is called Babylon. The merchants of the, woe, woe, O great city. O Babylon, verse 11, the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron and marble. It's like Wall Street. Cargoes of cinnamon and spice of incense. Myrrh and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages and bodies and souls of men. You see what this religion is? Things first, people last. That's false religion. Money first. And people last. So listen to what I say. Beware of power-hungry clerics who are wolves in sheep's clothing. Beware of churches that are political and that proclaim the candy-coated gospel of cheap grace. Beware. Beware of hierarchies that demand obedience contrary to scripture and reason. Beware of yourself and your carnal inclinations to neglect Bible study and attendance on time at the preaching of the word. Should we forget religion? Bad religion? Amen. But there is a religion that comes from God 
and I would embrace that. Would you come over here to Hebrews chapter 12? I would embrace the religion that comes from God. And I may have to look a bit before I find it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 to 24. Describing the church, it says, the true church. The people of God, the elect. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So listen to this. Find a church. So this to the congregation out there in television land. Find a church, big or small, where Jesus is the Lord, where the one true holy gospel is proclaimed where the people believe, say it with me, sola Christus, only Christ, sola scriptura, only scripture, sola gratia, only grace, sola fide, only faith, the battle cry of the Reformation. And where people keep the commandments of God rather than the traditions of men, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So let it be written. So let it be done. Amen and amen. Hello, friend. I'm John Carter. I'm here today to tell you the most amazing news. I want to thank you firstly in Jesus' name for your magnificent support. We are on our way to Port Moresby, the capital of Papua New Guinea. We are going to see the amazing power of God. We are going there to preach the everlasting gospel. I'll be preaching every night outdoors in the national stadium. The locals tell us we will have over 100,000 people a night. Some say 150,000 people. A few have said maybe 200,000. But I want you to know this. We go in the name of Christ to preach the gospel and to save souls. And I'm saying today, I can't do this without your help. I've got to raise right now $500,000 for this great campaign that is going to shake an entire nation for God. Please be my partner. Write to me, John Carter, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. In Australia, my Aussie friends, please write to Terrigal. The address is now appearing on the screen. Please stand with me in this tremendous outreach to the people of Papua New Guinea. We used to talk about Mission Impossible. All of a sudden it has become Mission Possible. This is an opportunity to reach an entire nation for the Lord Jesus Christ. Please write to me today and I want to say to you, from my heart to yours, thank you in Jesus' name. Sick and lame to set the captive free, to break the prisoner's chain, white still be in the dark, grappling for the dawn, longing for somewhere, somehow. But love came for me. Love friend.
rescued me. Love called my name. Love took my place. Sweet Lamb of God, I'm bowing down. My eyes have seen. I'm finally free. Love came for me. spotless land my sin would be too much for you to take me as I am but of the blood of Christ that washes over me flowing from your hands your feet I don't have to where I'll be Cause love came for me Love rescued me Love called my name Love took my place Sweet Lamb of God I'm bowing down This bed.